There's been a few times where I've seen handwritten letters, you know, about her history with the Korean War. When she got married to Joe DiMaggio in 1954, the troops just loved her. So think about the mail this lady would get. The first thing you have to remember with her autograph, and you can see how her M moves so flowing. The Thunderbird came out originally, I think, in 1963, and uh, this has just got a legendary tone. And then they glue the wings onto the side after. With this all being one piece that you lay the fretboard on, it's got a lot of resonance, really, really thumping low-end tone. This is all natural. In 1979. Yeah, this is a beauty. Can you believe this? The segment kicks off with a customer trotting in with an Abraham Lincoln print, convinced it's a gold mine because, well, it's honest Abe. He goes on about its age and the history it might have witnessed, while it sports a dignified layer of oxidation that just screams old school cool. The expert chimes in with a mini history lesson about iron filings and ink and their charming habit of rusting, which casts a shadow of doubt over the print story. It's a twisty ride already, and just you wait, the plot thickens. Look at my Abraham Lincoln etching. That's not an etching, that's a print. Okay, my Abraham Lincoln print. Okay. <laughs> I thought Abe was bald. Why would you think that Abe Lincoln was bald? Because he always wears that top hat. Stove pipe hat, and he wasn't bald. Oh, excuse me. Now, here's where it gets spicy. The expert throws a curveball by suggesting the print could be the handiwork of Joseph Cozy, a notorious historical forger known for his eerily good fate. He dives into the specifics of Cozy's forgery finesse, particularly how he flubbed the alignment of the letter A in Lincoln's signature. As the segment wraps up, we discover that not only is the print a forgery, it's a photocopy of a forgery, dropping its value, but not its intrigue. Buckle up, the next revelation is a doozy. He could forge just about anything. Joseph Cossey was one of the most famous forgers in American history. Cossey faked everyone, from Benjamin Franklin to George Washington, and sold them to big time collectors. He even forged a copy of the Declaration of Independence. This is something that was done, I believe, 1920s, 1930s. Oh, really? You've got to see this to believe it. The customer's reaction to learning his treasure is actually a twice-removed fake, is a priceless mix of shock and acceptance. He decides it'll make a stellar conversation starter instead of the payday he hoped for. His journey from potential fortune to quirky keepsake is a roller coaster that's just warming up. Next up, a tale involving Mark Twain that's bound to tickle your fancy. I mean, because you don't even have the forgery. Right. This is a copy of a copy? That's a copy of a forgery. It's not even the real forgery. All right. Thanks for breaking Thank it Thank you. Man. Appreciate it. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make me an offer, but I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation piece from this point on. Guess what rolled into the shop today? A stock certificate allegedly issued to none other than Mark Twain. The customer's eyes are twinkling with visions of dollar signs as she recounts how this piece of paper was hiding in a book bought at an estate sale. The backstory is rich with potential, sprinkled with a dash of Mark Twain's legendary wit and a mysterious mining company. It's a historian's dream until it isn't. But keep your eyes peeled. The truth about this certificate is just around the corner. It's Clemens. Samuel Clemens. Do you know what Mark Twain means? No. Okay. He was a riverboat pilot, and he just didn't go down the Mississippi River. You had to navigate down it. And when you dropped your line into the water and you had 12 feet of clearance, um, you marked the Twain. Oh. oh Mark Twain. Okay. okay. Hold on to your monocles, folks. Doubts pile up as the expert questions the likelihood of Twain using his pen name on something as official as a stock certificate. He also notes how the certificate's overly simple design would make it a counterfeiter's playground. The conclusion, it's likely a decorative piece from the roaring 20s or 30s, meant more for walls than wealth. But don't wander off yet. The story takes a turn with some Wells Fargo belt buckles that might just be too good to be true. My other concern is I have never seen a stock certificate printed like this. Even back in those days? Even back in those days. If you own stock in a company, you presented your stock and your dividends were paid. If it was printed this simple, anybody could counterfeit it. Just everything about it screams fake. Well, that was a bummer about Twain, wasn't it? The customer's disappointment is palpable, but she's quick to pivot to plans of hitting the casino instead. With the stock certificate saga concluded, she's left with a nifty souvenir rather than a windfall. What's coming up next with those belt buckles might just knock your socks off, so don't touch that dial. The bank, anybody could start an express company. They had stagecoaches going from town to town. I just love the fact that it's from Nevada. I mean, that would make it extremely rare. During the gold rush, well,
Wells Fargo made a lot of money off a lot of people. They would ship gold and other valuables and eventually grew into one of the biggest banks in the world. Ready for a wild ride from the Wild West? A customer saunters in with a trio of Wells Fargo belt buckles, allegedly crafted by the high-end jeweler Tiffany and company they're supposedly as rare as hen's teeth, tied to the iconic Gold Rush era. The buckles come with a tale of their discovery at a flea market, supposedly originating from a Montana museum. It's a collector's dream narrative, but are they genuine? The suspense is real, and we're about to find out. This makes me feel terrible when this happens. At least it was only 100 bucks. Yeah, it's been a lot worse. I never buy anything fake, no matter what. Just having it around the shop is risky, because an employee might think it's genuine and sell it. That could turn into a real nightmare. You'll want to sit down for this. The supposed Tiffany craftsmanship comes under scrutiny as the expert points out several red flags that suggest these buckles might be modern fakes rather than historical treasure. Even a supposed authentication letter is suspected of being part of the scam. The discussion serves up a hearty slice of skepticism, proving that even in the collectibles game, all that glitters is not gold. But stick around, Marilyn Monroe is about to make a posthumous appearance that could turn everything upside down. If this is a genuine poem written by one of the biggest sex symbols of all time, we've got something really special here. All right, let's see how good of a poet she was. Yes, I'll read it to you. You see me on the silver screen, also on Life magazine. My master has been many men. You've seen us both time and again. Who wouldn't be jazzed about Marilyn Monroe memorabilia? Enter a customer with a signed photo, a handwritten poem, and some personal item supposedly linked to the blonde bombshell herself. Provenance sounds legit. Snagged at an estate sale with a touching backstory of Monroe's connection to her fans. It's a tale that tugs at the heartstring, blending Hollywood glamour with a dash of personal touch. But as we dive into the authenticity check prepare for twists that could rival any of Monroe's film all right well that's good to know you got any paperwork with it I don't have any paperwork that's a shame without it I don't have a lot to go on I'll tell you what mind if I have a buddy of mine come take a look at it he works for PSA they're one of the most reputable signature people there is out there this part's a real nail-biter the expert casts a critical eye over Monroe's signature and the handwritten poem unraveling the romantic narrative thread by thread the revelation that the signature might be a secretary's work rather than Mary Marilyn's own scribble deflates hopes faster than a popped balloon. The saga of the star-studded items takes a turn from potentially priceless to questionably authentic. Don't go anywhere. The next item's controversy might just top this one. To a market, they were told they were ivory. They spent a lot of money on them. I was told it was ivory. Ivory would be a lot heavier than this. Who says? It says me. Bone is porous. Ivory is not. Ivory is completely solid. If you look close, mm -hmm. see the panels, the way they come together like that? Ever wondered if that antique was the real deal? Deal, a hopeful customer presents what he thinks is an ivory tusk, looking to secure a quick loan. The plot thickens when the expert swiftly debunks its ivory status, revealing it as mere bone dressed up to deceive tourists. It's a classic case of expectation versus reality, serving as a cautionary tale about the pitfalls of the antique trade. The truth about this ivory will leave you either shaking your head or chuckling at the folly. Stay tuned, as the final twist in our tale is just moments away. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, but I don't loan on pretty. I loan on what I can sell it for. Okay, I mean, that's basically what you got. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm very upset. I was uh, told it was ivory, and years and years later, now I'm finding out that it's not. Can you believe this piece? The episode kicks off with a customer strolling in to show off a quirky desk that isn't just any desk. It's also a gun. When you press down on the inkwell, surprise, a bullet fires through a hidden compartment. The customer, filled with curiosity, shares his bewilderment about the desk's mysterious past and its slightly alarming features. Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the office, right? Stick around. The next bit is even more jaw-dropping. A gun. It's a gun desk. Yes. When you push down on the inkwell, a bullet fires out through the trap door. Sweet. That means I got a gun aimed at my right now. I'm coming down to the pawn shop today to try and sell my gun desk. Never seen anything like it. During a seemingly innocent hunt for a charming guestbook stand at an estate sale, the customer stumbled upon this desk and soon realized its deadly secret. His recounting of the discovery sparks a lively chat about the world of covert firearms disguised as mundane objects. And you thought your desk was cluttered. Wait till you see what's coming up. Before, I have no idea what this thing is. I only buy guns that are made 1898 and back. That makes it an antique firearm that doesn't have to be registered with the ATF or anything else like that. 
like that. The problem I have here is I don't know the date this thing was made. Do you mind if I have a buddy look at this thing? Because I am just completely lost here. Not at all. What will they dig up next? Confronted with a desk that could be packing more than just pens, Rick decides it's time to call in the big guns, an expert, to verify if the desk counts as an antique. This is crucial because only antiques can be bought without going through a heap of paperwork. Brace yourself. The expert is about to drop some knowledge bomb. Not having strings on it, I kind of have no idea. It could sound amazing. Okay. You know? So, I mean, what are, you, what are your concerns? Um, basically, is it legal to own? And any idea what it's worth? This is kind of a tough one because I don't think you get in any trouble owning it because there's a lot of this stuff floating around. It's been around for, you know, ever. People have been making stuff out of tortoise. How will the expert tackle this? In comes Sean Rich, an aficionado of antique arms who looks over the gun desk. He's puzzled about its practical use and theorizes it might be a quirky collector's item or possibly a prop from an old spy flick. He emphasizes the need to pin down the desk's age to navigate the murky waters of firearm regulation. Hang tight. Sean's about to make a call that could change everything. It's old antiquated technology. I'm not going to be able to get any film for it. You have Bill McCord's name and social security number carved on it. I'm sure. assuming you're not Bill McCord? I'm not. Second of all, somebody engraved something in there right there and removed it. For me to buy something and say serial number removed, and the fact that you're not Bill McCord's name on it. Sure. This complication adds a twist as Rick and Sean delve into the legal intricacies of owning a concealed weapon that's cleverly disguised as furniture. They discuss the possibility of deactivating the gun to sidestep legal hurdle. This move would transform the gun desk into a peculiar yet non-lethal collector's item. You won't believe the solution they're considering. It's a real doozy. Even the most skilled guy with that hammer was never going to get a perfect strike every time. That's why you'll see like this edge is off center. Mm -hmm. They're all off center a little bit. No two are identical. Mm -hmm. um, everything about this is right. It's perfect. Well, they find a way out of this pickle. Encouraged by Sean's advice, the seller decides to deactivate the gun mechanism, hoping to make the desk a safe and legal sell. Rick, though bummed he can't snag it right away, is intrigued by the possibility of owning this bizarre piece once it's been neutered. Don't dash off just yet. The conclusion to this saga is right around the corner, and it's a corker. You think that shekel's real? I don't know. I just think somebody should have checked before we bought it. Yeah, hopefully next time Rick will be more careful. I've been in the coin business my entire life. It's real. There's no problem. We get to keep the coin, and they're still giving me hell. Vital rolls in with what he claims are spectacles from the 18th century, hoping to snag a cool $5,000. He shares a story about discovering them in an antique store about 10 years ago, setting the stage for some old-time glamour. I've got something here which I think is pretty spectacular. A magnifying glass. No, it's better than that. Bam! That is 18th century onyx diamond authentic spectacles. Sweet. I think Sherlock himself would be rather proud. Don't you? <laughs> hmm. Corey, ever the skeptic but intrigued, takes a closer look at these shiny objects. He notes the luxurious materials, platinum, onyx, and diamonds, but can't help but question the necessity of such extravagance for something as mundane as spectacles. But when you put them all together like this, it kind of puts you in a conundrum. You mind if I call my dad over here? He's just going to give me a better idea of what they're worth. Okay. Let me go grab them real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. I think there's definitely something here, but since I've never seen a pair before, it's worth asking for a second opinion. Not quite sold on the glasses story or price, Corey decides it's time to get a second opinion from his dad, Rick. Plot thickens as he wonders about the real value of these antique beauties. That intro really sets the stage, doesn't it? Let's see how the plot unfolds next. When he brought out his dad and told me they were worth seven to $800, I was a little bit disappointed. I honestly thought they were more valuable than that. I'm going to disagree because I've seen similar ones online valued at $5,000 plus. Is that what they want for them or is that what they're selling them for? Oh, that I don't know. <laughs> Rick takes the stage and quickly bursts the bubble by suggesting the spectacles are likely from the 1920s, sporting an Art Deco style rather than the 18th century. He gives a mini lecture on the history of spectacles, making them sound more like fashion icons than Vision Aid. We call it Thunder Chicken. I'm here at the pawn shop today to try and sell my 1979 Gibson Thunderbird bass. Well, I got it about eight years ago. I found an ad online. The little gentleman in a small town in Tennessee had it. Oh, I played it and it is butter. For being played since 1979, 
done, it's in immaculate condition. After a quick assessment, Rick pegs the value based on the materials alone, mentioning about 10 grams of platinum and some not so flashy stones, far less than the customer's lofty expectation. 20 or 21 bases, six of those were natural finishes. Uh, I think three of which currently have been destroyed or lost. To see this in front of me is kind of cool. So you almost like a unicorn. Okay, um, now, now you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> I like unicorn, that's good. Rick values the glasses at a mere dollar seven hundred dollar eight hundred, much to the dismay of Vital, who had visions of a five thousand dollars payday dancing in his head. That twist sure was unexpected. Brace yourself because the next segment is a doozy. Well, my man, I'm gonna tell you this, buddy. You are my favorite type of customer. Don't see any reason to negotiate with you. You came in, knew exactly what you had. I'll give you the seventy five hundred bucks and a little bit of extra for that bucket of chicken. Yeah, all right, that sounds good. Man. Cool. Thank you, sir. Meet me over there. Yes, sir. Scott struts in with a 1979 Gibson Thunderbird bass guitar, hoping to strum up $7,500. He boasts about its rare natural finish and pristine condition, clearly proud of this musical gem. Get out of here. Hey, how's it going? Corey, the bikes are back in the warehouse. Let's yeah. check them out. We do motorcycle frames, we do gas tanks, we do oil tanks, we do handlebars. We got 5,000 different parts we make here in the US. Corey, admittedly not a guru in rare guitar models, acknowledges Gibson's solid reputation and decides it's time to phone a friend, an expert who can strum up the true value of this rare find. Tales above Harley and technology, but they've kind of gone in and out of business a bunch of times, right? Yeah, absolutely. I believe it was in the 70s, uh, didn't they run out of stock? I think you're right. Which is basically what made a lot of customers switch to Hondas. Honda was a big, big player in the mid to late 70s. 10 years ago, you couldn't find a Triumph on the streets. They're real collectible, absolutely. The expert tunes in and confirms the rarity and potential high value of the base. Corey, feeling a mix of relief and excitement, decides to play it cool and agrees to the asking price, tossing in a bit extra for a bucket of fried chicken as a cherry on top. Wasn't that a smooth jam session? Next up, get ready for a bumpy ride. These bikes both run great, and I know my dad really wants to triumph, but I'm not sure they meet my motorcycle standards. So it all depends if Steve wants to lay off the gas and lower the gap on this price. Left you in the dust, big hoss. This thing looks intimidating, and let me tell you what it is. Rick sends Corey and Chum Lee on a mission to snag a 1970 Tiger Triumph motorcycle, hinting they should be able to wheel and deal it down to around $8,000. There was no money to be made on the bike. I did you a favor. No, son, I wanted the bike for myself because what do I ride, guys? Triumphs. So I basically paid for you guys to have a vacation? Not you guys. I argued to bring the bike home, Rick. I really did. Corey, showing a hefty bias for Harley Davidson's over Triumphs, engages in a comedic debate with Chumley. His bias clearly clouds his judgment, adding a layer of humor to the negotiation process. Well, in order to get the thing working, I need telegraph line. <laughs> There's no telegraph line. <laughs> right. um, so what you can do, though, is this. I mean, we've done these for all kinds of collectors, and what we do is we basically take it all apart, eliminate some of that telegraph system, rewire it. Despite the clear mission to acquire the motorcycle, Corey's preferences steer him away from sealing the deal, frustrating Rick, who really wanted that bike. Can you believe that debacle? Stick around, the next item is even more jaw-dropping. All right, I'll meet you at the front counter. All right, thanks. What do you buy a guy who owns a pawn shop and can get whatever he wants? An old rusty box full of broken wires. But once Rick Dale finishes shining it up, I'll send it up to the ranch so it's there to surprise him. And he's gonna love it. Leave the pawn shop, thousand miles to Perfect. Okay, cool. Let's be a ball. A customer walks in with a Kentucky Fried Chicken chandelier lamp from the 1980s, aiming to cluck away with $2,000. She recounts a quirky story about how this piece of fast food memorabilia landed in her living room. Complete package. You're welcome, Rick. Thank you, guys. I said hug? thank you. Sure, you can get a hot jump. What in the world is this? This is a Kentucky Fried Chicken chandelier lamp. Tell me where you got this. My husband and I worked for Kentucky Fried Chicken in 1980. Despite noticing some damage to one of the lamp's insulators, Corey gets dazzled by its uniqueness and the sentimental tale behind it. He skips the step of calling in an expert for a second opinion, drawn in by the lamp's nostalgic glow. Probably 60 to 70 years old. The buckets are in perfect shape. Unfortunately, one of the insulators on one of the arms has broken. I think this chandelier is extremely unique. I'm really hoping to get $2,000 today for my chandelier. Without further ado, Corey agrees to fork over $1,500 for the lamp, possibly paying over the odds due to its sentimental value rather than its market worth. That deal was finger licking good, wasn't it? 
Just you wait, the upcoming item is even more spectacular. He longer to cook, so he actually was the guy that invented like the pressure cooker or deep fryer where he could actually mm -hmm. cook fried chicken. Mm -hmm. It didn't take like an over an hour to make anymore. And he would mm -hmm. lease them out to gas stations and stuff like that. And that's where Kentucky Fried Chicken actually came from. I mean, the guy was a serial entrepreneur. Can you believe this find? A customer strolls into the pawn shop with an Egyptian scarab ring, a family heirloom passed down by her late father. She's itching to know if it's as ancient as her dad's story suggested. The scene is set with her curiosity piqued about the ring's true origins and its emotional significance. Hang on to your seats because this is just the beginning. It was given to me by my father a couple of years before he passed away, and I'd like to know if this is the real thing or not. All right. So was your dad like Indiana Jones or something like that? Not, not in the least. <laughs> the scarab ring is from the 18th dynasty, 1500 BC. Just when you thought it was just another day at the pond, Shop. The customer spills more beans about the ring's storied past, revealing it was a gift from her father's globetrotting stepmother. She's keen on finding a new owner who cherishes this historical gem as much as her family did. Brace yourself, the expert's about to make an entrance. Scarabs are generally carved from stone and glazed either blue or green. It looks like an old scarab, but the question is, is it really 3,000 years old? Ooh, what is this? Oh, that is the card from the guy that sold it over in Egypt. Buckle up, here comes the good part. Rick, the shop owner, gives the ring the once over, musing that in ancient Egypt, everyone and their mummy had a scarab. A curious note from the seller asserts the ring hails from the 18th dynasty, circa 1500 BC, which stirs up more intrigue and skepticism about its real age. The anticipation builds as they decide to bring in the big guns and experts on the way. I mean, this thing is truly is 3500 years old there, there's something here but i am not a 18th dynasty scarab jewelry expert but believe it or not i know someone who is <laughs> really okay. yes I, I do give me five minutes things are getting spicy now sensing this could be a major historical find or a major flop rick decides it's time to call in a seasoned expert to weigh in on the ring highlighting its alleged 3500 year old lineage the customer's fingers are crossed for good news the expert's arrival is up next expect firework thank you very much thank you for I, solving the mystery i enjoyed seeing it i think this is an excellent buy for the shop because the ring is beautifully created and it's still in good condition okay so obviously it's not going to be $15,000. No, I guess not. The moment of truth arrives with a side of letdown. The expert, after a thorough examination, confirms the ring's age as approximately 3,000 years, but values it way below expectations at around $450. This sparks a haggle fest, ending with the customer settling for a modest $360, a far cry from her $15,000 dream. Next up, a piece of history that'll knock your socks off. Just where he puts a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible and then the approximate year that they believe it was printed. Is it printed on the other side? Yeah, it's a double-sided leaf. It's printed on very fine paper that they imported from Italy into Germany in the period, and it's been hand rubricated with colors with red and blue after it's been printed so that it looked more like a manuscript. Hold the phone, history buffs. A new challenger appears with a single page from the Gutenberg Bible, touting it as a relic from the dawn of mass printed literature. The significance of owning such a piece sparks a detailed discussion about its origins and rarity. But wait, there's more. See how the experts drool over this one. To think how quickly they went from printing a book like this to having people copy the invention to go throughout Europe setting up printing centers all through Europe within 50 years. It literally was like the internet. It went from this to scientific books to fiction to dirty pictures to uh, a little bit of everything. This is where it gets epic. A scholar dives deep into the Gutenberg Bible's pivotal role in revolutionizing the printed word, mirroring the impact of the internet today. His passion for the page's historical and educational importance lights up the room. Get ready, because they're about to put a price tag on this priceless artifact. The page of it. <laughs> Right, a leaf. A page to me, a leaf to you. Well, a page is actually one side and then the other, so it's two pages, one leaf. All right, you got me, okay. Well, the most important thing is it's a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible. Yeah, and I just touched it. Time for some serious wheeling and dealing. The expert places a hefty $80,000 value on the Gutenberg page, sparking a tense negotiation dance, highlighting the high stakes of trading in priceless artifacts. But don't wander off. The next item is eerily intriguing. What do we have? We have a pottery duck from Colima, Mexico. All right, uh, Pops, 
You know anything about ducks from Colima, Mexico? Um, a little bit. Um, you liked rubber duckies when you were a kid. Filled the bathtub up with them. He, he had a blast with them when he was like three. I'm at the pawn shop today to sell my old pottery duck. I got the duck from an antique shop in Scottsdale, Arizona. From the sublime to the spooky, a customer brings in a pottery duck from Colima, Mexico and whispers of haunted happening since it waddled into his life. He's desperate to offload it, believing it's more cursed than cute. Keep watching because you won't believe what the expert has to say. 300 AD, ancient. So what's it worth? It's authentic, it's old, it's rare, it's stunning. 8,000. Okay. You're not gonna whip out like your x-ray machine or anything on it? I don't need to. It's got all the signs you wanna see. Bob, I appreciate you coming down. My pleasure. Cue the dramatic music. An expert confirms the duck's authenticity and historical pedigree, dating it back to ancient times and valuing it at a cool $8,000. The shop shells out $4,000 to take this spooky quacker off the customer's hand. And just when you think it can't get weirder, a mysterious Chinese bowl steps into the spotlight. So I'm going to say a good solid wholesale price on it would be three thousand dollars okay well thanks man yes sir absolutely I really appreciate it i am absolutely amazed that there is a bowl like that floating around how did that bowl get to las vegas my my hope is that someday it may end up in a museum here comes a twist the finale features a stunning chinese bowl from the chen lung period suspected to be a royal relic an expert in asian antiques is summoned to solve the riddle of its authenticity and worth the bowl's exquisite Exquisite craftsmanship and regal past unfold in a riveting exchange. The closing deal is just around the corner. Don't touch that dial. Okay, I'll take the 38. Okay, cool. I really appreciate it. Leave that right there. Follow me and we'll go do some paperwork. 3,800 is pretty close to the 